Debbie Montgomery Johnson, founder of the nonprofit, The Woman Behind the Smile, and your host of Stand Up and Speak Up, a show that is about each and every one of us. Many of us have something, something we're hiding, something we're ashamed of, something that through no fault of our own or through our own making we keep hidden, and that in turn keeps us hidden from each other and the world. Good people go through terrible situations. Wise people know when and how to let it go. Everything that happens to us helps us grow, and while it may be hard to see it right away, the most important thing to do is to change your perception about your circumstances. Regardless of what your personal experiences or traumas have been, this showcase series is designed to ignite the light in you, as well as providing safe harbor, education, personal growth, and resources so that no matter where you are in your journey, you'll have the courage to move on when you're ready. Stand Up and Speak Up features ordinary people who've been through extraordinary situations and struggles and found the courage to step out from behind their smiles and speak up about their experiences and the lessons gleaned from those experiences. Everybody heals at a different pace, and we recognize that. So come on in, have a listen, and enjoy the ride at your own speed. Hello, everybody. Welcome from beautiful North Carolina. Yes, my friends in Canada, it is cold here, and it's fun to see the mountains and see the lakes, but I'm chilly. So today, my show will be hosted by our special host, Dr. Tim McGinnis, the founder of the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams, or SCARS as we know it. I'm thankful for Tim for being there for me and for our special guest today, Dr. Maria Riguero from the Florida National University in Miami. Tim and Dr. Maria have known each other for a while and they have some really great information to give to you today. So here we go, folks. Have a wonderful stand up and speak up and I'm gonna pass it on to Dr. Tim and Dr. Maria. Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Tim McGinnis. I'm the chairman and founder of the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams, a nonprofit based here in Miami, Florida that provides support for crime victims and also crime prevention. Um, I'm standing in as host for Debbie Montgomery Johnson. I'd like to thank our, our guest, Dr. Maria Ruggiero, who's the president of the Florida National University, one of the major universities here in the greater Miami area for joining us on our show. Uh, Dr. Maria, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so very much for having me in your show. And I'm looking forward to having this conversation so that your listeners can really uh, obtain some more information on different areas of what is needed and what we do in Bay County. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So what I'd like to do is begin by asking you about your own background, because you are one of the prominent women entrepreneurs, in fact, entrepreneurs, period, in the greater Miami-Dade area. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about your history and how you came to Miami and how this led to the foundation of the Florida National University. You know, um, I, uh, I was born in Cuba, and my parents brought me to the state. Thank God for that. And basically, um, we, my parents always, always taught me that the best dowry that they could provide was an education. That an education Absolutely. Is, is very important, and only God can take that away from you. Mm-hmm. So basically, uh, when we came, we, w- we went to New York, and I went to CCNY where I became an electrical engineer, and it was in New York that I met my husband. He was a dentist in Cuba, and after a while, we moved down to, for health reasons, we moved down to Miami. Uh, we were, I was participating as an electrical engineer uh, with AT&T at the time and ba- and then continue my education further. And by doing so, I got involved in education. I do have a master's from the University of Miami in business. And mm-hmm. then I have my uh, doctoral in education. So 
having said that, I am a firm believer in education, and that's how we got here, and that's how we, my husband's vision was to establish Florida National University where immigrants in the area were going to be, a, and of course everyone, but he wanted to make sure that those individuals that were coming from abroad were going to have the opportunity to be become part of our society in the American dream. This is how Excellent. it all started. Yes. And and when when was FNU uh, established? And we well originally FNU was you know accreditation is a it's a very important part of education and yes. originally we were part of SAC COEI and that was back in 1982. So in 1987, we were able to really start working with SAC COC. So if you read our catalog, it will tell you 1987 because that is the SAC COC area. Uh, era. Mm -hmm. and, but prior to that, we had the uh, SAC COEI era. And uh, since then, we were offering degrees to our community, the only difference was general education, you know, applied, applied degrees versus the Associate of Science, Associate of Arts. We never offer applied degrees, and that's why we transitioned to SAC COC. And what, what does that mean? Know, the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges. It's okay. one of the regions, and it is very important for students to make sure that when they are attending any institution, they find out about accreditation, whether national, exactly. regional, or programmatic. Many people and and we, certainly, we certainly have a, a catastrophic uh, example of that. There was a very... Uh, prominently visible uh, college here in the Miami-Dade area called Mattia College for a long time that turned into a complete and total disaster when, uh, when their true accreditation deficiencies were ultimately discovered. So I, I applaud you on that. When you began, what kind of courses were you offering at FNU? We were offering, you know, we were in a light hail also business, we were even in electronics. But one of the challenges that we found when we were offering programs in electronics was the math knowledge required by the participants. So mm -hmm. after a while, we really stopped offering the uh, electronics degrees. And basically, like right now, we have six divisions. Psychology is something that is so important, and so many students are seeking degrees in psychology because of many different reasons, together with allied health or humanities and, and natural sciences. You know, Can I go you, back to engineering for just a second? Absolutely. Was was one of the things that you discovered, I, I myself have been in Miami since 1985, and I moved here to found what might have been the first major software company here in Miami that about five years later we renamed as Tiger Direct, well, Tiger Direct and then ultimately TigerDirect.com. And one of the things that I found in my experience in the greater Miami area during especially the, the second half of the 80s was Miami was a desert in terms of the technology industry. Up in Boca, we of course had IBM and their personal computer divisions, so Boca was the technology hub to some extent, but really wasn't much going on in technology in Miami-Dade itself during that period of time. Did that 
play a role in your decisions about ultimately discontinuing um, some of your, your engineering courses at that time? Uh, it was basically the, the lack of preparation in math. It was very right. difficult, very difficult for the students. They wanted the hands-on, but it's like everything, you know. Right. Uh, you, can, you cannot be a doctor and help people if you don't have the academic foundation to know what it is that you're going to do. So yes. it's the same thing with math. You need to have that foundation. And we see that now, thank God, uh, they have realized that it's very important to be working on science. And that's why we hear so much about STEM and now right. STEAM because they're also adding the arts. You know, it's having a balance in everything we do and making sure that you are going to be prepared and doing what it is best for you. And Absolutely. That's very important. You Absolutely. Know, when I moved... When I moved here from California, I, of course, was an electronics engineer. I was an engineer like you and came from Silicon Valley, having been an assistant director of corporate research at Atari in the early 80s and having practiced my profession in places like Japan and the United Kingdom, etc. cetera. And it was, it was a significant contrast, but you're absolutely right. Today, Students are vastly more prepared. Our, our Miami-Dade school system is night and day difference. The university system in Miami is night and day different with the introduction of your university and, and others in our area. Um, so I, I think to some extent uh, you deserve some of the credit for that as well. Thank you. You know, we, one of the divisions we have, it's nursing. And uh, it is very challenging to be able to prepare the workforce in nursing and make sure that they are going to be successful. Exactly. Some people, some people feel we're very demanding, but the issue is that those nurses are going to be taking care of you, me, and the rest of the population. So we need, to pre we need to ensure that they have the academic core that is required to be able to help the sick in our area. Exactly. And that, that requires knowledge and preparation. Not only skills, but knowledge and preparation. Isn't a part of your accreditation based upon the success of your students in taking uh, state certification exams? That is correct, especially when you're talking about programmatic accreditation because, like I mentioned, there's national, regional, and then programmatic accreditation. You know, yes. they are all measuring, and, and the Department of Education the U.S. Department of Education is looking at what is your graduation rate? Mm -hmm. What is your retention rate? What is the passing rate of your graduates in the different exams that they must be taking in order to perform the duties of their profession? For example, nurses, they have to go through the NCLEX, and that is a national exam that they can they need to pass before they become registered nurses so obviously all of that is measured by the different accrediting commissions and that is something that we you know make clear to all our students from the onset and it's very important because you are going to be spending years of your life preparing yourself to be proficient to join the workforce and have the academic knowledge and the skills that are required. So you need to make sure that you are progressively 
preparing yourself to do so. And, and of course, you know, the Department of Education, as well as all the accrediting commissions, are measuring how your students perform once they graduate from the different programs that you offer. Let me ask, what were some of the challenges that you faced in the early days through the late 80s into the 90s to be taken seriously as an academic institution in Miami-Dade or in Florida or even regionally? Well, we were blessed because we, from the onset, the core of academicians that joined us to offer the academic knowledge to the students, mm -hmm. they were very good. So the students are able to recognize that, and based on their accomplishments, they know whether they are attending an institution that they would like to attend or not. Right. So obviously, it was very, you know, it was very important. It was very important for us to ensure that we were offering quality in education. That was the only way that, you know, we could ensure that our students were going to be getting places. You know, it's very funny because I remember at the beginning, I had a student that came and told me, all I want is to graduate with a degree in accounting. I don't know why you make me take this general education courses. Um, I will have to take 15 credits in general education, and, um, you know, I'm not going to be using that. And I said, I think you're, in, yet, I think you're incorrect. I think that um, you need to understand that you need to be good with the numbers, but you need to be able to convey your message even from the onset when you meet with human resources. So if you want to get somewhere, it's not going to be only the numbers. It's going to be the numbers and the general education. So, you know, um, it's, sometimes it's a little bit difficult for the students to understand the composition of the curriculum that they sure. are, that they need to take. So, but they, you know, that's part of what we do. We need to teach them so they know, they know that they have to, they have to be able to accomplish the different subjects that they are supposed to master during the time that they are at the institution. And when they're successful and when they're recognized in the workplace, that's the best, that is the best recommendation that any institution can have. How often do you hear from your alumni with regard to their career success and the role that FNU played in, in their professional development? Very often. You know, I try to use different, in my case, myself, you know, I try to communicate with them or be available through um, different platforms like LinkedIn and right. uh, Facebook so that mm -hmm. they know that if they have a concern, if they have whatever it is, and they share with me all their accomplishments, and that is very rewarding, very, very rewarding because it's Excellent. good to know. Yes, yeah, it's good to see that people are succeeding. And I like, like I tell many, I said, uh, you know, you want to come to school and make sure that you're going to be able to increase the database of the knowledge that you have aside from making sure that you're going to be excellent in the area that you have chosen because at the end of the day, they want to increase their disposable income. Mm -hmm. So they want to be able to offer better opportunities for themselves 
and also for their family. So you need to be performing at the level that employers are looking for in order to be successful and recognized by them and be able to achieve your accomplishments. Can I ask about one of the curriculum areas that you provide? Obviously, one of the areas that I'm involved in is my own nonprofit, SCARS, which is a crime victims prevention, uh, excuse me, crime victims assistance and crime prevention organization. And we provide support for a little over 7 million victims over the last six years with uh, an actual footprint in 60 countries, but we support victims worldwide. So one of the areas that's always of interest to us is criminology. And that's an area that you include in the offered curriculums within your university, correct? That is correct. That Can is you tell very... us a little bit about your program and what careers uh, your students are prepared for? Well, obviously, in criminal, just, in, in criminal justice, uh, we're offering the associates, the bachelor's, and the master's degree. And this is appealing to uh, individuals in the military that are going to be joining the um, civil life and to the police department in order mm -hmm. to ensure that they are prepared for uh, promotion. And they also, you know, um, and, and basically even the different entities like the fire department and so on. And there are different areas based on their needs and what they intend to do in the future that they're going to be choosing whether to follow a, an associate's degree or a bachelor's or a sure. master's in criminal justice. So it is very important that um, you know what your future plans are so that you can, in fact, um, do whatever needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understand. In keeping with that, one of the areas that I know is, has been near and dear to your heart is your foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about your foundation, how it was formed, what your motivation was, and, and then we can lead into some of the, um, the focus areas of what your foundation is directed towards. How did it begin? We founded the Dr. Jose Reguero Scholarship Foundation. And, and that was your husband, correct? That is my husband, and the reason why we did this was because basically there were cer certain needs in our community that we needed to address, and we found it what uh, we called the powerhouse. Mm -hmm. And the reason we brought uh, individuals from different, you know, different paths of life and we put together events that were educational in nature. So we were dealing mainly with school children um, as well as many other different um, nonprofits in our community, and we were bringing information to the community so individuals that needed assistance would know what to do and where to go. We have yes. the domestic violence event, the human trafficking, or the missing children. And, and basically what, um, what we were trying to do is bring in the different entities in our community and gather them in, this, in the different events we were conducting to ensure that people were empowered with information that will allow them to make the appropriate decisions when decisions were needed. And basically, um, it, we conducted this um, four consecutive years. We were dealing with 
the different elements in our community, and it was very important for everyone to know what were the resources that were available if they had any kind of issues um, such as the ones that I mentioned. I, and, and I can certainly, uh, you know, testify to the fact that uh, that in your powerhouse meetings uh, was everyone from representatives from Senator Rubio's office, from the attorney general, state attorney, governors, uh, law enforcement associations, local police agencies from Broward, Miami-Dade, and um, local uh, offices from you know city of Hialeah, Miami, and and many others. So it was extraordinary to see that kind of gathering in a single room for these various events. What led you to to focus on these topic areas, if I can ask? What was it that that stood out, or where you felt that there was a deficiency, or did any of these touch you personally? As you know, information is power, the same way exactly. as educating, educating our community is power. You know, now um, the state of Florida decided to, um, to do away with certain funds that they have had for years, and I was telling a couple of senators, you know, the ADN of poverty is education, and when you attack education and you limit the resources that people have in order to become well educated and obviously more powerful to impact our community what you're doing is reinforcing poverty and and victimization absolutely on the topic of of human trafficking we communicate directly with uh in fact we're we're a my organization scars is a is a formal partner of the department of homeland security and we're registered through doj's office of victims of crime and we communicate with europol and interpol and, and other agencies around the world and we see that human trafficking has not slowed at all in fact it continues at double digit growth rates worldwide and in the world online, which is our area of focus online, or what are called cyber-enabled crimes, we see that there is a direct correlation to the kinds of online victimizations that present opportunities for traffickers to groom individuals as candidates for capture and trafficking. Um, one of the things that I was profoundly impressed with in your in your powerhouse group were those non local nonprofits especially that are in the business of of helping to rescue individuals that are trafficked and to to what extent do you think Miami Dade is is a hub for human trafficking what is your experience with what this part of the country means in terms of both supporting that incredibly horrible industry and also in terms of uh, potentially working to stop it Tim you you know you hit the nail on the head that is an industry and they're looking for money and obviously they're looking for uh, events and individuals that have the finances to seek those horrible services right. and that is why it's so important it is so very important that we're all well educated to help stop human trafficking and right now we have we see every day the growth in awareness and how a you know, a, you, a, an Uber um, chauffeur or driver or someone in the airlines or someone in a restaurant, it's noticing issues that are 
not right and they exactly. are and they are identifying victims of human trafficking. So it is important that individuals are aware because uh, we see that we there is a lot of money coming into the Florida state and people are going to be following that money and offering certain services that should not be offered at all. But if we allow our community to be properly prepared to ensure that they can fight this horrible causes that we see, like human trafficking or missing children, mm -hmm. et cetera, or domestic violence, then we are, in fact, meeting our commitment because we are helping to identify what it is that they have to, to, to fight and how can they fight it and how can they identify issues that will help them uncover victims of those hideous maladies. Exactly. And, and obviously involving school children, whether they be uh, primary, middle, or, or, or high school, is obviously a critical method of creating awareness that can help save them. Unfortunately, in the world of uh, cyber-enabled crime that I deal in, one of the fastest growing demographics is actually uh, children from 11 through, through, 20, uh, through young adults age 25. This is the demographic that is currently exploding in all forms of cyber-enabled crime, from, from scams to sextortion to grooming for human trafficking and abduction and, and other means. In, in general, as much education as we do, it seems like we're, we're losing ground slowly. Have you considered, uh, I, I know that you had mentioned to me privately that as a result of the pandemic, a lot of your advocacy activities, uh, campaigns, marches, etc., had to be shut down for the obvious reasons. Have you considered as a way of restarting this perhaps uh, roundtable discussions, open, open presentations, um, uh, even webinars offered by uh, or, or through the university to help maintain awareness of these activities? Absolutely, we have. But you know, the issue here is that in most cases, the individuals that will be participating in those webinars or roundtables will be educated adults. And when we're having this massive, massive events that we were having right. before the pandemic, we were getting to the possible victims or individuals that could be helping victims of this crime. And that is why it was so important to have, you know, this, events that we were conducting. Um, however, I think that hopefully soon, once more people get vaccinated, we're going to be able to sort of go back to some sort of a normal. I don't know if it will be new or what, but um, then we will be able to start again having events that will empower those individuals that will need it the most because we want yeah. to get to the possible victims. We want to get to those individuals that the kids at school that might know of somebody that needs that information or somebody that is being tra trafficked or, you know, and that is what we want to do. We want to make a difference in the community with the people that need it which are the victims or possible victims that they will need, they will know how to defend themselves from this horrible crime that we're having to fight. Well, perhaps there are some ideas that could be considered such as maybe a uh, kind of a summer camp 
program as we go into the summer, particularly latter summer, uh, late June or, or even in July before school n normally would start, there are opportunities to uh, get students in a, a setting where they can be informed and prepared to avoid such risks in the future. Hey, Dr. Tim and Dr. Maria, this is Debbie. I just want to pop on really quick. Tim, I, really, I love that idea about summer camp for the kids and, and teaching them about the dangers of online and trafficking. And Maria, I was curious, what is your vision of the foundation going forward? What would you like to see it do in, going forward? We will like to, again, grow the foundation so that we can, in fact, ensure that we are going to educate more individuals in our community because if we get together and we are basically expanding the level of knowledge of all the resources that are available, we're going to see that it doesn't matter how or what it is that we're doing, we're going to see a decrease in all this crime. In, indeed. One of the things that my own organization, SCARS, is, is very successful at is in the educational arena on the topics that we cover. We have well over 100 social media uh, footprints and, and our websites, which reach literally millions a year. Uh, have you considered going into more online media and information available through your foundation to make that information more accessible beyond the the singular events that are that are are staged during the year of course uh, the only uh, the only drawback we have is all the ex expenses that that will bring so we have been spending the dollars in the in the different areas to actually help the victims or help the individuals that have approached us or are seeking help. Um, you know, one of the areas that might be worth exploring, and I'd be happy to do this offline, but one of the areas that might be very interesting to explore is the development of uh, a portal which would allow the various stakeholders in each of these topics to provide content so that you don't actually have to create it yourself. In other words, development of an advocacy volunteer model that would allow for your powerhouse participants and partners to help create this for you, possibly uh, even connected with the university website because obviously in the areas of domestic abuse, human trafficking, sexual abuse, these are all topics that can profoundly affect the student body. So there's a great deal of crossover there as well. Correct. I fully agree with you. And that is a, um, I think that will be a very strong tool to continue to provide the resources and knowledge, especially during the pandemic. Yeah, as you know, one of my areas of expertise, having spent a generation uh, in the development of Tiger Direct, uh, is in the area of, of electronic publishing and the efficiencies that come with that and cost constraints and, and finding mechanisms to, to publish vast amounts of information very inexpensively. And, and SCARS employs that model to, to this day. So we'd be happy to, you know, collaborate in any way that we can to help further those goals. So that's perhaps something that we can talk about offline. Um, Absolutely. Do Dr. Maria, I would like to thank you tremendously for having been my guest on Debbie Montgomery Johnson's Stand Up and Speak Up show. Um, one of the things that we, that we do at the tail end of these shows is to talk a little bit more about uh, the subject matters that we touched on, particularly as it relates to areas that are important to 
uh, both Debbie and to myself in the organization. Debbie is a, a board member of, of SCARS as well. Uh, one of the areas that I think is, is particularly important, and I actually would, would like to ask you about this, is in the area of, of education scams. Um, I was unwittingly myself involved in trying to develop web technologies through one of my own companies uh, many years ago for that local college that I mentioned that was doing such a good job of, of taking everybody's money and then not de delivering academic results. What do you see are the challenges in, in educational scams, training online, certification, uh, for a fee kind of programs out there. Can you tell us what your opinion is or, or what you think uh, is going on out there in regard to this, helping uh, prospective uh, students who are looking for education or looking for certifications, how to both potentially identify scams and what are some of the scams that are going on out there? Basically, like we mentioned before, uh, it is critical for individuals to ensure that you are going to be aware of the kind of credential those organizations hold. You're talking about, for example, the issue of um, certifications on nursing, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. it is, it's important that you know that you're going to a reputable institution that will provide you with the academic knowledge that will allow you to sit for that exam. Many times, unfortunately, people think that uh, there are short ways of accomplishing their goals, and that is not so. You need to ensure that you're fully prepared to challenge those exams, national or regional, so that mm -hmm. you can, in fact, be able to be successful in the needed areas. So just don't make those decisions lightly. You need to ensure yourself that wherever it is that you're going to be doing or whatever program you're going to be following are reputable programs that are licensed and accredited to do so. One of the things that we recommend for, for all individuals that may be connected with a scam is your starting point for, for reality is going to be a state government. If, if someone is contacting you about a corporation, a business, a school, etc., Validate that they are, in fact, a registered entity with the state, that if licensing is required, that the, that the state licensing boards or bodies have that institution or that entity licensed, and that's something that people can easily check on. So if they're looking for a nursing school, they can simply look on Google and find state licensing for nursing schools and verify that information. Another thing that that we see happens all the time is business impersonation. So the, the use of an EDU web domain address is limited to accredited real universities or, or schools, correct? It should be. Yes. So it should be. make sure that it is an EDU uh, uh, web address and if necessary check with the state to confirm the the contact address uh, email phone numbers website etc uh, we only have a couple of moments left so um, at this point um, I want to thank you so much for joining us today uh, you're an inspiration in the in the Miami-Dade area I've known you for years and uh, and, and hold deep respect for the work that you've done and your contributions to our community. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so very much for having me in your podcast, and I really, I am really uh, looking forward to the interaction 
in future endeavors so that we can all work together and make a difference in our community. Dr. Tim and Dr. Maria, this is Debbie coming back in. And I just wanted to thank you so much for participating in our show today. And for everyone that was here and heard about Florida National University, look into it. It's an excellent opportunity for those of you that are seeking higher education. Thank you, listeners, for being here at Stand Up and Speak Up. We are dedicated to encouraging you to remove the mask of embarrassment and to being your best self. If you've been a victim to any cybercrime or scam, visit againstscams.org for assistance and guidance about options and recovery. For SCARS, the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams, is an incorporated nonprofit crime victims assistance organization based in Miami, Florida, and we're here supporting scam victims worldwide. This episode has been sponsored by BenfoComplete.com, a vitamin supplement company that supports happy and healthy hands and feet. For those with neuropathy, if you or anyone you know struggles with the pins and needles or numbness in their hands and feet, check out our Benfotimian products at benfocomplete.com and use the special code STANDUP for a 5% discount on your purchase. Again, thanks everyone for being with us here today on Stand Up and Speak Up. Go to my website, thewomanbehindthesmile.com for additional information and resources. Have a great day. Subscribe to my YouTube channel and enjoy the replays of these shows always and come back and meet with us next week. Have a good one. Bye now.